All right, hello and welcome to your first video lecture of the semester. Uh, today we're going to talk about before first contact, and this is going to be what happens before Europeans come to the United States and come to North America and South America and colonize. So there are three groups of people we're going to talk about. Uh, first group are called Native Americans. Uh, they go by different names depending on who you talk to. Native Americans, First Peoples, Indigenous Peoples, a uh, word that's not really used much anymore is Indian, but they're all talking about the same people. And Native Americans are thought to have come to North America by what was called the Bering Land Bridge. This was a piece of land that connected Alaska and Russia together uh, somewhere between 10,000 and 15,000 years ago. Uh, the reasons for this are geological in origin, but long story short, there were glaciers, the world was a little colder than it is today, and the sea levels were lower as a result, so you could walk from Russia to Alaska. Now, these people, the reason they came to Alaska, they weren't going on vacation or anything like that, they were looking for food, and they were following their food. And the spread of these first peoples depended on the availability of food. They were all hunter-gatherers, meaning that they had to find and catch or or uh, forage for everything they ate. Uh, agriculture, we take advantage of it today, but it really only began about 7,000 years ago. It is not until about 1,000 years ago that agriculture became the primary food source. There are some Native Americans out there that uh, hunting and gathering stayed their primary food source even today. Now, one special group to talk about are the Anasazi. They live in the American Southwest. Uh, they were from New Mexico, Arizona, that area. And they were able to build canals for irrigation. They could bring water to their fields and they went a little bit heavier into agriculture than some other people. Another really cool thing about the Anasazi is they built perfectly straight roads to connect their villages. And sometimes you can find and still use those roads today. So that's just pretty neat. Uh, there's also a group of Native Americans called the Mississippians. Uh, they were found starting around the Mississippi River Valley in the middle of the country, and they went throughout the southeast as well. Uh, they were known as mound builders, and they built cities that could hold thousands. Um, Creek, Cherokee, Seminole, those groups of people that we are familiar with here in Georgia, they grew out of the Mississippian culture. Uh, three places that I want to tell you about specifically, there's the Etowah Indian Mounds. They're located near Cartersville. You may have been there maybe as a elementary school or a middle school trip. Uh, that's the most complete Mississippian site in the southeast. If you've never been there, there's a, a six earthen mounds, two of which you can walk up. Uh, it's, it was a site of a village that held a couple thousand people, and it was active from about 1000 to 1500 A.D., uh, the state of Georgia has a little museum there you can go and look at, and it's right outside Cartersville. A second group that's less known in our area, but it's actually bigger than Etowah, it's the Kolomoki Indian Mounds. It's a state park down near Blakely, which is south of Albany, pretty close to Florida, actually. It's the earliest Mississippian site in the southeast. There are eight mounds, uh, two of those you can walk up. Um, there's also a mound that they have excavated and turned into a museum there. And it too was a village site. And estimates are people were living there from about 350 AD to about 600 AD. Now last but certainly not least is the city of Cahokia. If you've ever been to St. Louis, it's right on the Illinois side of the river. In fact, if you go up into the St. Louis Arch and you look out towards East St. Louis, you'll see the Indian mounds off to your right. Uh, it was the largest Mississippian site that we know of. Uh, estimates are it was six square miles, held as many as 40,000 people, multiple mounds, uh, there was a wall around it, and it was huge. What's really cool about Cahokia is those people came, lived in the city, and then left before Europeans even arrived. Uh, Native American culture. Uh, their culture is bound together by kinship groups. Uh, these, these are related families and they grow in size. They get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, one way to think about this is a Native American tribe or Native American ethnic group. Um, and the kinship, that's what's going to give the Native American culture 
uh, beliefs, rituals, customs, their way of life. Uh, gender roles in Native American culture were almost equal, uh, some variation depending on where they're from, but the men were often gone for extended periods of time, either at war or hunts or to do business. Uh, the women did the everyday raising of the family, the women provided the immediate food, and they maintained the household. And then religious leadership, while there was some female participation in religion, it was very much male dominated. Now they have a religion that consisted of a creator, uh, prayer rituals, afterlife, spirits, and they also have this cool thing called the trickster. Um, I highly recommend you just look up trickster myths. Um, they're pretty cool stories told from various points of view. And these trickster myths, it's some sort of being who likes to joke around and they use the trickster myth to teach lessons and to teach ethics. All right, you also have Europeans. Uh, the Europeans, you, this is what you've learned since you were in kindergarten. Uh, European society was based on a hierarchy. Think kings, queens, knights, commoners, peasants, you name it. If you've seen any movie about Robin Hood or whatever, knights in shining armor, you know what I'm talking about. Most Europeans, up until fairly recently actually, lived an agricultural lifestyle. Uh, there were some towns with a few thousand people, but they were actually few and far between. They were the minority. In Europe, kinship groups weaken and the nuclear family becomes more important. Uh, the nuclear family is kind of the traditional family, mom and dad, kids, and that's about it. And then you have Christianity. Christianity is still important today. It was more important back in the 1500s. And Christianity, in many ways, was the glue that kept Europe together. Now, around 1500, the Reformation begins to split the Catholic Church apart. If you've had world history, you've learned a little bit about that. If not, you'll learn about it somewhere. But the Catholic Church splits into two. You end up with the Catholic Church and the Lutheran Church. Even though Christianity splits, it's still going to be the cultural glue holding Europe together. Now, you I also have to talk just briefly about the Renaissance and the Age of Exploration. Uh, with the Renaissance, uh, people are turning to science, people are starting to ask questions, why this, why that, and people aren't quite as afraid of exploring as they used to be. And that brings you right to the Age of Exploration because you have all these new scientific inventions, all these new ways of life, and people want to test them. For the first time, people ask questions. One of the questions they ask is, I wonder what's across the ocean? And then somebody gets on a boat and sails across the ocean and finds out. All right, your last group are West Africans. Um, West Africa, if you look at a map of Africa, it's going to be the part of Africa with that big bend on the western coast. Basically, it goes from Senegal to the Congo or maybe Angola, depending on where you're looking. In West Africa, there are a lot of similarities to Native Americans. The kinship group was extremely important. Uh, West Africans lived together in villages. Small-scale farming was taking place. Hunting and gathering was still the primary way of living. And there were shared gender roles. Women farmed and maintained the household. Men hunted and men raised livestock. One difference, though, uh, the family of West Africa was matrilineal, meaning that heredity and history and everything was passed down through the mother. Um, so <clears throat> it wasn't your own kid that was important. It was really your sister's kid that was important because all of the hereditary went through the female side of the family. Villages were ruled by nobles and priests. Sometimes there was a king or what they would call a big man who would gather power. And then there was a Native religion, usually animism, meaning spiritual animals and things like that, spirits and nature. And these native religions would very often mix with or be replaced by Islam. All right, I'm going to keep this first video short. Um, just a reminder, though, uh, starting next week, you'll have a video on Monday and you'll have a video on Wednesday because Monday was a holiday and the semester hadn't started yet, you get two videos at once. So I'm going to keep this one short. 
this one is in lesson one. Your second video is going to go into lesson two. All right, we'll talk to you again in just a few minutes.